I'm still trying to get a hang of Facebook and using Facebook Live, everybody. Just trying to get used to all the gadgets. <laughs> At this time, I don't have anyone to work my equipment, but nonetheless, I'm here doing what God has commissioned me to do, and I'm being diligent and fervent in it. So we're just going to wait a few seconds, and while we're waiting, please take the opportunity to enjoy this musical selection by one of my favorite artists, um, Naomi Rains, from her Back to Eden um, CD and uh, CD and. and um, songs you can buy them on iTunes and all of those other areas. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful CD. I suggest you get it. It will bless you. It's great for all of our worshipers. And we'll be getting ready to start in a minute. I hope you brought your tea because <laughs> I have my tea. Yes, hi. God is good. We're never alone. While we're waiting and people are coming in, I would like to um, basically give you some background information about Tea Talk. Um, Tea Talk Thursday is a part of Seth Deliverance um, Outreach Center where our focus and purpose is based upon our slogan called We Call Tree. I see, I t we uh, grow trees. I see the uh, T Cindy, thumbs up to you. Amen. Um, <laughs> that's cute. I love the teacup. Well, anyway, our focus is on the per is based upon the slogan that we use under Seth Deliverance Outreach Center, which is We Grow Trees. And what that basically means that um, we're trying to develop trees of righteousness that produce healthy and strong, good fruit in abundance by the transforming of people's minds and hearts to reflect the nature, mind, and heart of the only true and living God. So as people are coming in, share, 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 give me some hearts, give a wave. How you doing, Pastor Teresa Lee? How are you this evening all the way from Virginia Beach? Amen, amen. Nice to see you on here. Oh, my! one of my favorite pastors, Pastor Sherry Grant is watching. I love her. And just, she doesn't, I always, I just love this woman of God. And she is getting ready to do a play called Why Do You Want to Be Me? If you are in the tri-state area, get a ticket September 13th, 14th, and 15th. I want you to get a ticket. Her plays are phenomenal. Hey! Pastor Sherry, I love you. I love you. I just love you. I just love you. But please, let us support people who are out there in the trenches. She is an awesome playwright. Awesome, 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 awesome playwright. And so you do not want to miss the opportunity to miss one of her plays. Hey, there go my baby. Hey, Davida, how are you? How's everything? Hey, Terrell, how are you? Thank you all for tuning in. I'm so thankful. Hey, Pastor Ernest, thank you for tuning in. Hey, Pastor Solomon, how are you doing? I'm glad that some of you are tuning in. I'm ready to get started. As I was um, talking earlier, I was informing everybody how Tea Talk Thursdays came about. It is based upon the, uh, it's part of our self-deliverance outreach center where it fits under what our slogan is, We Grow Trees. And um, the point is, is that God has always said that I'm building you, Monique, to be a tree of righteousness and that I'm going to have you to cultivate and, and, and mature other trees so they can produce healthy fruit in abundance. And we do that by transforming our minds and hearts to reflect the nature, mind, and heart of God. Good evening. Good evening. So let us get started. Today's topic is Heart Matters. And I'm calling a state of emergency on this matter, meaning I'm making a declaration by alerting our kingdom citizens to change their normal behavior and to implement an emergency plan to address this matter. Why? Because the condition of our hearts matter. Hey, Tara, how are you? Thank you for tuning in. The heart is the soil 
that determines the fruit on our trees. This is why, hey, my daughter, Sierra, is on. Hey, Sierra, how are you? Thanks for joining in. And I'll say it again. The heart is the soil that determines the fruit on our trees. Hey, it's my friend, Deborah. How you doing, Deborah? How are you? Kisses, kisses, kisses to you too, Tara. <laughs> We're all getting ready to go back into another school year. Oh, man, we're going to need all the strength we can get. Oh, and here's another one of my good friends, Sheila from the Bronx, New York. Hey, Sheila, how are you? Trying to get these people are coming in, and I'm thankful. I feel so blessed and so honored that all of you are tuning in. I'm totally, truly humbled by God over this matter. You know, this has been a struggle for me for years, and God had wanted me to do Facebook and do things on Facebook, but for my own personal um, uh, self, I had to get over the uh, place where I felt comfortable doing that, but I decided that this is the year of breaking all barriers, and I'm not going to allow the devil no longer to hinder, to stall, or to stop me from doing those things which God has commissioned me to do, but anyway, let's get back to the topic. Well, we're back here and the topic is for those coming in is that hearts matter and what I'm saying by this is that we have to believe that the conditions of our heart matters to God because the heart is the, the soil that determines the fruit on our tree last week we talked about the what kind of soil are you we talked about the different types of soil and for us to examine hey destiny how are you and to to examine the condition of our soil to determine what kind of posture are we good ground that's the question or is our heart really good ground or are we um, um, a ground that's hardened or are we a ground that's rocky or are we a ground that is wrapped around a lot of thorns so today as we are pursued the same type of topic on the same matter, we're going to be dealing with the heart because the heart we learned last thir Thursday is the soil. It's the soil where the conditions of our heart determines the fruit that we are able to produce on our tree. And this is why it is so important that we check those conditions because the one who examines the heart daily is requiring us to look at it and make some changes. Now, how many of you know, know someone who is bitter, nasty, ill-tempered, angry? All of these things that we see and notice about people are all some of the conditions of our heart. And those are just to name a few. There are many things that become a part of our heart. But Proverbs 4, 23 through 26 instructs believers, above all else, guard your heart. For everything we do flows from it. To keep our mouths free of perversity, keep corrupt talk far from our lips, and let our eyes look straight ahead. Fix our glaze before, before the Lord. Give careful thought to the path of our feet. Hey, Jennifer. And be steadfast in all of our ways. And so right here, we should see that God is asking us, above all else, to guard our heart. So come on. As believers, we should no longer have heart valves that are clogged. God said in Ezekiel that he would give us a new heart, a circumcised heart. What happens since, trans since salvation? What happens since our salvation translate transformation that caused our hearts the heart and that caused our hearts not to remain free and clear like a good ground I'll tell you we forgot to guard we have forgot to guard our hearts when Solomon refers to guarding our hearts he really means the inner core of a person the thoughts the feelings the desires the will and the choices that are made by a person whoever he or she is the Bible tells us in Proverbs 23 and 7 and 27, 19, that our thoughts often dictate who we become. That the mind of a man is reflects who he really is, not simply his actions or his words. That is why God examines the heart of a man. 
not simply his outward appearance and what he appears to be. You know, as, as, as individuals, we tend to look at a person from their outward appearance. We tend to make a judgment out of that most times because we really can't know their heart. God says, I am the only one that knows a man's heart. He's the only one. So until we connect to God in that fashion, we will not be able to know, to know what a man's heart is, nor will we really truly understand our own. God says we don't even know what's in our heart most times. Sometimes we pass over things and think because we sweep things under a rug that it's gone. But some things stay large, lodged in our hearts and they grow and they fester and they become like those thorns and those bricks and they become hardened places where God can no longer really move because we're not guarding what we put in our heart. So today on Tea Talk, we're going to talk about two heart conditions. The two conditions are heart murmurs and congestive heart failure. And before I begin tonight, make sure that you're inviting some of your some of your followers and share, 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 and don't forget to send the hearts. So let us just pray a little bit to make the ground pliable for the master's use. So Father, right now we are asking for your help to have a clear, direct path to you that is free of distractions and hindrances, noise, vain imaginations, strangers, voices, pride, deaf ears, and busy minds that we who are your people will have an ear to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. We block any form of witchcraft spirits and evil works and their devices from infiltrating the hedges of our walls. And so we thank you for your mighty protection and your provision in Jesus name. Amen. So let's talk about heart murmurs, people. Heart murmurs. There's a lot of heart murmuring going on. And we must grow in order to stop it. There's a lot of heart murmuring going on. Going on and we need to grow to stop it. So let's produce some fruit by pruning some of those dead branches in our lives. Heart murmurs are abnormal flow patterns um, due to a faulty heart valve and heart valves act as a door to prevent um, the back flow backward flow of blood into our hearts did you hear that faulty heart valve acts as doors this is how we let things into our heart we have open doors or weakened doors causing us to leak and let those former things back into our heart. See, spiritual heart murmurs occur when believers engage in certain things. And we're, I'm going to talk about a few of these certain things today. And you're going to see it. Where if we are found guilty in those areas that are what? Causing us to have heart murmurs. And one of those things is complaining. <laughs> complaining. Now we've all done it and many of us still do it. We complain about the music. We complain about people. We complain about leaders. We complain about sermons. We just love to complain. And therefore, Philippians Philippians 2.14 becomes one of them verses in the Bible that many of us really don't want to learn more about or talk more about. Let's face it. We don't want to be accountable for a lot of things. We tend to avoid um, our issues and our monsters within and our little foxes that spoil the vine by making excuses for it. Philippians 2.14 says this, do everything without complaining or arguing. Complaining is a form of grumbling. Complaining isn't just a, 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 a harmless sport. It's sin. It's a serious sin. Paul writes, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angels. That was in 1 Corinthians 10 and 10. You remember the story. After Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, they went into the wilderness and they wandered around for 40 years. Why? Because they murmured and complained and grumbled most of the time they were there. And as a result, well, you know the end of the story, many of them died. Some of us are dying 
because we are doing the same thing they did. We are complaining and grumbling in our wilderness seasons, even when God has chosen to take care of you against all of the odds. We have a history with God. We have seen God take us through situations after situations after situations, and yet we still grumble. God provided for them in the wilderness. He, their, their clothes grew to them. They, he provided food. He provided water. He provided and met all of their needs. And still yet again, they complained and grumbled and said, let us go back to Egypt to eat the leeks in the God. We were better off there. How many of us are saying we're better off in the world? We were better off when we didn't. Was doing our own thing and making our own decision and going where we wanted to go and doing it our way. Some of us are actually doing it. Sometimes we do it silently. We think we always have to say words. Sometimes our actions just say the same thing. If I to ask you to take out the garbage and you hear me and you refuse to do it, and you're constantly being reminded to take out the garbage and you still refuse to do it, what are you actually saying by your actions? You're saying either I don't want to, I'll do it when I feel like it, or I'm just not going to do it. Okay? So we can say a lot of things absent of words. We can say things in our action. So what happened with them, they're dying out there. And some of us are dying for the same thing. And we need to not die in the wilderness. We need to produce fruit. We need to be like the two that gave a report of what God could do and not like the other 10 that came with a negative report. And stop the complaining, stop the murmuring. God does not like when we grumble because when we do complain and grumble, you got to understand that our complaints aren't against people and they're not against situations. They are actually against God himself. And the sin is sometimes we share those complaints and grumbles with others. And some of these others are not strong enough. Some of them are like deers with wobbly legs still trying to stabilize. And so therefore we can cause them to stumble and we can cause them to fall because they're not stable or mature. And God frowns on us um, spreading bad reports and among fellow believers. He frowns upon that. So he, I urge you to, I urge you, and, and, and I urge you to first, when you have a complaint and when you have a disagreement or when you don't understand something, is that you go to God with it. God urges us to what? Cast our cares upon him. All of our anxieties and our concern should be placed upon God. What do they say? They say, instead of complaining about it, pray about it. Instead of complaining about it, pray about it. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And God can give you peace or he can bring understanding. And there are times that we can go to certain leaders that are trustworthy. And there are trustworthy leaders, people. Everybody's not corrupt. But there are trustworthy le trustworthy leaders that you can go to and, and talk to. And it, it'll stay right there. And what will happen is they'll be able to soothe that place where the complaint is. And be able to help you jump the hurdle of that murmur. And remind you of who God has been to you. Sometimes we have to be reminded. Sometimes we have to revisit who he was when we went through this situation, who he was when we went through that situation. Come on now. The Israelites just walk through the Red Sea. Okay? Now, we have Red Seas in our life, but they weren't like the Red Sea they faced. Their Red Sea, they walked and saw the the pillars of water hovering over them and God was dividing and they were walking on dry land and you would think after seeing such a mighty act of God that they would go into that wilderness knowing that God is faithful and just to do what he said he would do and yet they still murmured and yet they still complained and yet they still were not satisfied with what the Lord was doing who does, does that sound somewhat like us? Are we just like the Israelites today? Still not satisfied with what God is doing in our lives because we have an expectation of what we think God should do and the way he should do it. And when he does it, we complain and we murmur. You know, our tests and trials come to do what? To, to make us stronger, 
to 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 prune us and to cut us and to cause us to bleed out those things that impurities that infest us in our spirit soul and our mind and somehow or another we think that god is punishing us and he's being cruel to us so we start complaining and then what helps us to complain is that we got our eyes set on somebody else we're looking at what somebody else is getting and what somebody else is doing and what we think they're not going through. Just because they don't make their things known don't mean they're not going through because they are. Everyone is going through something. It don't have to be the same thing. But sometimes we need to take our gaze off a of man and put our gaze back towards God where God said, I'll give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And I'll give you joy that will build upon your strength. And so in those things, we need to learn to guard our hearts. We need to not have heart murmur problems. We need to stop the complaining. But that's not the only thing that causes us to have heart murmur issues. Gossip does the same thing. Oh yeah, and we know this plagues the body of Christ so 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 much everyone i know has experienced the harm of gossip before whether the people talk talking didn't mean it direct harm but the result of the gossip is always resulting in what broken trust and hurt feelings gossip can be defined as information about the behaviors or personal life of other people with often without the full truth known or revealed God has warned us to stay away from people who gossip and to guard our words when we speak about others. That is the word of the Lord. Yet, we what? Embrace it. We don't stop it. We pick up the phone. We sit around in cafeterias and lunchrooms and locker rooms and every place. And we don't turn our ear deaf to it. We don't tell the gospel we don't want to know or uh, don't bring that to us. You know, we just open our ears because our ears want to hear. Scripture also says that gossip is another word for gossip is slander, which means making a false spoken statement, statement damaging to a person's reputation. Slander can destroy someone's marriage. It can destroy someone's job their wealth as well as their families. The tongue has power and we must be careful and on how we use our words. This goes on all the time. The Bible tells us what words we speak and what words we should not speak. And I have here a list of scriptures because I went and did some research. I wanted to know how much information was in the Bible on the on the on the topic of gossip and there's a lot of scripture on gossiping too many to even run through today because i have other points that god wants me to address so if you have a pen you can write them down or you can come back to the um replay and write them down later but proverbs 16 29 proverbs 17 9 proverbs 18 8 and 20 um 21 Proverbs 2019, Proverbs 2620, Psalms 3413, Psalms 41 and 7, Psalms 141 and 3, Proverbs 18, 16, 7 through 7, of 6 through 7, 1 Timothy 5, 13 to 14, 1 Timothy 3, 9 through 12, Proverbs 26, 20 to 22. Romans 1, 28 to 32, and Titus 2, 2 to 5. That's a lot of scripture on gossip alone. That should indicate to us that God feels a certain type of way about gossip. This is part of the heart murmurs, the gossiping. The body of Christ is plagued with this issue. We don't just, we just can't seem to shut our mouths from running and what we do what we don't say we print and what we don't print we share on Facebook or Instagram or so forth we share everyone else's business and attack those 
who put our business out. Isn't that funny twist? We're going to get mad with someone else for putting out our business, but we're putting out everybody else's. Well, you know how that goes. We reap what? What we sow, don't we? That's what we do. Not only do we need to guard our hearts, we need to also learn how to do what? Guard our mouth too. We need only speak what God is saying about a person instead of rumors and lies. Even if it is true, even if what they're saying is true, so what? Who are we to judge the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, or the why of someone else's life? See, gossip is like telephone. By the time the thing gets around to you, it's, it's done changed its tune and its meaning. People have already added yeast to it. They have added their own opinions and their interpretations to it that we become like the dogs that carry the bone. And that's what we become. The old saying, don't be the, watch the dog that carries the bone. Because normally the dog that carries the bone is normally the guilty one. We should not be partakers in their fellowship. Again, God has warned us not us to has warned us to stay away from people who gossip and to guard our words when we speak about others. Okay? Okay? God talks about contentions, God talks about disputes, contentions in Proverbs 13:10. Believers are instructed how many times to avoid grumbling and murmuring and complaining. Exodus 13, Exodus 16 and 3, John 6, 43, Philippians 2, 14. By engaging in these activities, believers shift their focus away from the plans and the purpose and the past blessings of God to bring to the things of this world. See, that's what all of this does. It shifts our focus. See, we can't stay focused because we're too busy complaining and murmuring and grumble, uh, grumbling, having disputes over here, holding contention over here, gossiping, and therefore we get what? We, we, we stray away. We, we lose focus away from the plans and purpose that God, want, that God has given to us. And in order to stay focused, sometimes we just got to avoid some things. And when they come, tell them, this, tell them access denied. Tell them, access denied, not today. Not today, okay? Guarding against a complaining spirit <laughs> and cultivating a spirit of gratitude. We need to guard against a complaining spirit by cultivating a spirit of gratitude and trust. And that's how we step towards guarding our heart. We cannot be Christians that are striving for contentment we have to be Christians that are striving for contentment in all things, trusting in God to provide what is needed in his good time. Okay? And so comes the second heart condition, which is called congest congestive heart failure. What we just talked about was the heart murmurs, and what we're talking about now is congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is the ability, the inability of the heart to successfully pump blood through the body due to weakness within its wall. Congestive heart failure can result from hypertension, high blood pressure. It can result from heart attacks and abnormal enlargement of the heart. But the spiritual equivalent to congestive heart failure is anger, giving in to temptation, Excuse me, giving in to temptation and pride. Those are spiritual equivalents to having a congestive heart failure. Amen. Anger acts like a poison on our body, both spiritually and physically, and makes the believers more vulnerable to the temptation to hurt others with their actions and their words. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 instructs us to get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, but to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ 
God forgave us. Just as God forgave us. Okay? We can't lose sight of that. That's why we have to get rid of all this. Every Christian is locked into this constant, intense war with these demonic forces. We all are. None of us are exempt. These are war, warfare. This is spiritual warfare that we have to what? Uh, constantly battle with within our own selves. Not each other, but with our own selves. See, it's, this is not a battle between you and me. This is not a battle between you and whoever else it is. This is a battle within you that you have to conquer the enemies that are within and, you know, deal with the enemy in the inner me, okay? Because that's the greatest battle, the battles that are within ourselves. These things of anger and bitterness and rage and gossiping and complaining and contention and dispute, these are the things that we cannot engage in and we got to battle not to engage in that the enemy will bring situations and circumstances to draw us into these types of things so that we can what stumble and fall in these things and we've got to thank god of his mercy and grace that we are not consumed because it's only because of that and that we get new mercies and new grace every single day to be able to pick up and run this race again and again and again. But we can't be slowful in doing those things. We can't slack and lack in doing those things either. We got to be persistent in doing those things. We got to be intentional in doing those things. Okay? Why? Because one, they offend God, first of all. And secondly, they're not the nature of God. And third, if we're going to be a church without spot or wrinkle, then these things cannot be found among us. Okay? So that means that we have to what? We have to work diligently on dealing with those heart, th heart conditions that lie within us. We can't always point outward. We got to take the thumbs and go in, 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 in. And we got to examine our own hearts daily. We should be able to ask God in our prayer closets when we're in intercession, in those quiet, solemn moments with God. We should be saying, Lord God, create in me a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit. We should say, God, if there's anything that should not be inside of there, reveal it so I can deal with it. Pull it out. Let me see it. You know, because we will find out that as the heart is desperately wicked, hey, so are some of, so are we. Okay. And that in that heart does all the issues of life flow. And out of the heart, does the mouth speak out of the abundance of it, okay? So there's a lot of things that come out of that heart. That's why God said he has to give us a new heart. He has to circumcise that heart. He got to take that heart of stone and make it pliable and make it usable for him. We got to begin to have the heart of the Father, not the heart of man, but the heart of the Father. That's the heart we're aiming for. And so we can't lose sight of that. And so, when we look at that, the Bible tells us in James 4, 1, 14 to 16, tells us each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, honey. Sin always begins in the mind. A sinner must first conceive and dwell on the sinful act before he actually carries it out. Okay? Where does adultery start? In the thoughts, right? That where, where, where are the thoughts? In the mind. A first line, the first line of defense must be to refuse to even contemplate that wrongful action. You got to what? Refuse to contemplate that wrongful action. Apostle Paul tells us to take every thought captive so that it does not con so that it conforms to the will of the Father. Okay? So our thoughts, our heart, they're both connected and out of the heart does all the issues of life flow. So these are the things that we must contend with and contend for our faith. The next issue that con causes congestive heart failure is pride. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pro Proverbs 16, 18 tells us that pride leads to destruction. Pride leads to destruction. 
Proverbs 16, 5 says, Every one proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Did you hear that? It's an abomination to the Lord. Pride in your heart is an abomination to the Lord. Pride was the first great sin of Satan. Come on now. When he thought that he could be just like God. And tried and, and incited a third, one third of the angels to, to attempt a coup in heaven. <laughs> For this same reason, Satan did what? He was cast out of heaven. Satan, what all did he do? He attempts tempts Eve in the garden. <coughs> Okay, and Eve desired to be just what he said, as wise as God. So she what? Ate the fruit of the tree. Pride was and therefore has been and always will be part of the downfall of mankind as well. <coughs> okay, so pride is, a, well, what? Leads to destruction. It has been and always will be a one of the one of the areas that will lead to the downfall of mankind. Pride will also cause our hearts to harden. Now we learn that our heart is the soil. So here's a reason why our pathway and our ground and our soil was hard in the parable of the soil. Maybe the part uh, the the heart got hard because it was prideful, okay? And the pride of the heart has it says the pride of the heart has deceived you. You you who say to yourself, you can bring me down to the ground. He says, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Obadiah three. That comes from Obadiah three. He said, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who say to yourselves. Who can bring me down to the ground? Those are the ones that think that they are invincible. I'm going to say, they don't think their poop stink. <laughs> they think that they're untouchable. <laughs> they think their sins won't find them out. Because their pride causes them to be deceived. Their pride causes them to think that God ain't going to touch them. That they're going to get away with whatever it is that they're doing. Or that they're not wrong. Because pride won't allow you to see your error of your ways. It'll keep th making you look at someone else. It'll keep making you point the finger to someone else. But it will not let you see you as clearly as you think you can see everyone else. And another root of... Uh, and also, when I go back into thinking about the Israelites, we can go back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a what? Hardness of heart. Which was what? Pride and what? Arrogance. Even in the face of tremendous proof and witnessing God's powerful hand at work, Pharaoh's heart hardened caused him to deny the sovereignty of the one true living God. And what about Nebuchadnezzar's heart? Became arrogant and hardened with pride. He was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over the kingdom of men and set over them anyone who he anyone he wishes. We need to remember that. We need to remember that. God decides. We 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 forget that sometimes because we still think that the little bit of power or the little bit that we have is all that there is and that we are the set one and we got it all. Mm, pride will get you fooled that you don't have it all. We just have a little bit of something. Just a little bit of something. We don't have the whole thing. We just have a part, a piece of a something. And God may give a piece to another. And he'll give another piece to another. See, we can't say, what well, God, what did Paul said, I haven't obtained it all. We haven't obtained it all. We just got pieces. Little pieces. We still got more to get. We got still got more to do to get it. Okay? So we can't be so prideful and arrogant and thinking that with our prideful self, we puffed up. With our prideful self, we puffed up. We, we stand up in God's face like a peacock. Thinking that God is our servant when we're supposed to be his. Okay? So we need to come to God with humility. And that's one of the ways we can, we can prevent 
heart, congestive heart failure and heart murmuring going on, okay? This is one of the ways. We got to close those heart valve doors. In the beginning, I said to you, heart valves come are open doors. How many doors do we have open in our lives? And that's what we have to ask God. Do I have anything open that can affect my heart, that can cause my heart to sin against you? Okay? What is in my heart? See, when we really, remember, when we really want to be all that God wants us to be and be more like him, we're not going to be afraid to address the enemies in the inner me. We're not going to be afraid to look in the mirror and say, it's me, oh, me, oh, Lord, that stands in the need of change. It's not my brothers. It's not my sisters. It's not my mother. It's not my father, but it's me. Oftentimes when God gives me the privilege to talk with other people and maybe even in counsel, the first area I tell them, although you may be complaining about this person or that person, what they did and what they didn't do, the question comes to you, what about you? Because see, although they might be wrong in what they did, God still is going to address you in it. He's never not going to talk and deal with you in it because guess what it takes two okay it takes two so we got to deal with our heart conditions we have to deal with our heart problems see satan does not want man to obey god but to become his own god see this is what he wants us to do what he did and wants to do and that has become like God. Isn't that the trick he told Eve? He said if you eat of this fruit, you become what? Like God? Knowing like God? Come on now. It's the same trick. Just played on different people. And the more we're ignorant of his deceptive ways and his devices, we will fall for these things constantly over and over again. And it's easy to do. We've all done it. I've done it. You've done it. And if you sit there and say you haven't done this, you'll use a lie and ain't no truth in you. Okay? Because we've all done it. We've all done it. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so, But when we do, the great thing about it is, is that we can go to our Heavenly Father and ask for forgiveness and turn from that situation because there's a turn that does have to take place and he is righteous and just to forgive us and he doesn't even hold it and remember it no more. We just got to become more skillful and understanding what the ways of the enemy and how he trips and trips us. Okay, because he, he does the same trick, but he uses other people and mechanisms to do it. He's cunning. And I'm not glorifying the enemy. What I'm trying to tell you is that his, what his plan is. And that is to what? He wants us to disobey God. He doesn't want us to become a, 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 a one of unity. He wants us to be a house divided. He doesn't want us to be one one accord. He wants us to remain as a heart, house divided. He wants us to gossip, complain, and murmur against each other. He wants us to be angry with bitterness and, and all types of pride up inside of us. His plan is to destroy what God loves. And God loves his children. Above all else, he loved his children. And he still does. And what Satan does is we he wants us to become our own God. And he wants us to determine for ourselves, our own reality, our own meaning with our own ethics. See, he wants us to develop our own morality. And you know that ain't going to happen. We, we're going to determine what is moral to us, each as an individual. Well, this is right for me, but it may not be right for you. Okay? Isn't that where that do you mentality can, comes from? That selfish mentality of do you? Okay, because doing you means that you don't have any regard for nobody else but you. Whatever makes you, whatever floats your boat, whatever makes you happy, do you. No, because we can't do you and do God. You got to die in order for God to be glorified in you. You got to die. You got to decrease so that he what what might increase. Okay, so we got to start avoiding anger. We got to avoid pride. We got to avoid temptations. Okay? But these are all critical elements 
of guarding our heart. Okay? See, the satanic philosophy is the foundational philosophy. This satanic philosophy of you being God and God, Satan trying to get you to disobey God and live as a man with your own reality. When he said a man is only right in his what? Own eyes. What is that? That's the same thing. Determining for himself his own reality, his own meanings, and his own ethics. This is part of a satanic philosophy, and it's the foundation of sorcery, secular humanism, and new age mysticism. Mm -hmm. That's the foundational philosophy of this. This is what they promo. You can be your own God. You don't have to serve the true and living God. Okay? So we got to avoid the anger, pride. We got to avoid temptations. All of these are critical to elements of guarding the heart. Apostle Paul instructs us, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. <laughs> Philippians 4 and 8. Okay? Think on these things. He told us what to do. He told us how to do it. He's left instruction for us to guard our heart. We got to pull down those vain imaginations. All them thoughts that exalt itself against what? The knowledge of God. That's a battle. The mind is a battlefield. It's the place where the warfare is lodged. It's the place where the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Because he knows if he can come take over this piece right here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to produce our actions to do exactly what it thinks. Okay? Because he knows how powerful the mind is. That's why we got to do what? God. We got to protect it by doing what? Protecting our hearts. We got to protect the hearts, people. Come on. We got to put that breastplate on. We got to protect it. We got to guard it with all due diligence. Because dwelling on these things, God says, will help to build a guard fence around our hearts. Fence it up. Fence it up. And we're seeing in these latter days a lot of stuff going on. People are falling away from the faith. People's hearts are waxing cold. And you got to make sure that you are not one of them. That's why God is concerned about the fruit that you bear on your tree. That's why God is concerned about the heart, the soil of your heart. And whether your heart is good ground and pliable for the master's use. Nothing worse than being in ministry with an angry person or being in ministry with someone who's bitter or being in ministry where there's a lot of contentions and disputes and gossiping. Come on now. What, how is God going to get the glory out of that? The world is watching us. The world is watching us. They're looking for God in us. We are the God they see. This is what determines whether they want to trust your God. Amen. So this is what we need to do. We need to guard our hearts with all due, all due diligence. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I thank you that you will join me next week for Tea Talk Thursday. I'm going to begin early next week because I have some other things I have to do at another time. So I'm going to begin a half an hour early at 7.30, but I will be only staying on a half an hour. So I hope you tune in next week. And I'm going to finish this because there was still more that God wanted to talk about concerning the heart. It is a very great concern to God right now in this season that we become gr good ground, that we produce fruit on our trees because that's how we are. He said what? You know a tree by the fruit that it what? Bears. A corrupt tree can't bring forth what? Good fruit. And a good tree can't bring forth corrupt fruit. So the thing is, if your tree isn't bearing anything, if you're connected as a, a branch to the vine and it's not bearing anything, 
God's words is he will cut it off. He gives us time to produce. He gives us opportunity to produce. Okay? We don't know what the cutoff point is, but he does cut off. That's the key. That's what we got to realize. He does cut things off because he said it's useless. It has, it, it, it has no purpose. So we don't want to be people that get cut off. We want to be have purpose with God. We want to make sure that God can use us. So thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in to Tea Talk Thursday. Join me next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Yes, a half an hour early. Hopefully you'll be able to tune in. I'll be tuning in for another half hour to continue on Heart Matters. I hope you're able to tune in and have a blessed evening. It's Getting ready to thunder and lightning outside. I don't know where you are or where you're calling in from or where you're watching from. But here right now in Maryland, on the east, northeast side, the thunder and lightning is raging. So thank you again for tuning in. Bye. See you.